I'm not seeing because I'm screen sharing. I'm going to stop my screen uh, share. No. No? Okay. Um, great. So that's great. And again, we'll save, we'll save, uh, uh, we'll save these word bubbles, uh, and make sure that they're put on our, our, our website hub as well. Uh, and I'm going to X out of this window and share my screen back on the slideshow. Um, cool. So if I go back here. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I, I think we're all kind of on the same page about what makes up a society. And, and I liked seeing the answers and words that were coming up there for, for how societies change over time, how social change happens. Um, and I know that this isn't a, a course. We're not here to like lecture you. I, I just thought if you, if you, I, I thought this slide would be helpful as a reference, just some definitions about how uh, social sciences and humanities conceptualize social change, uh, and just making the point that, 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 that there are different sort of, each field takes kind of a different approach. Sociology looks at uh, why social, social structure, or, or like looks at the phenomenon of social structures changing over time as reflected by changes in cultural symbols, rules, behaviors, social organizations, and value systems, um, and, and how that leads to, to, to changing institutions over time. Philosophy talks about the theories of why things change. Um, psychology talks about social change from like the perspective of self-development, so like, like personal inner psychology. But we know that that, that like, that ultimately is a fundamental sh sort of part of how change happens collectively. Uh, and then political science looks more directly at so social change in terms of, of revolutions and movements uh, through a lens of power and struggle. Um, uh, and then sort of like some other sort of like anchor points in your conception around social change. Is social change gradual or radical? Is it incremental or continuous? Is it revolutionary or transformative? And is it top down or bottom up? And I think the pandemic is a really interesting, interesting time to think about social change. Uh, we've had to rapidly change our societies in response to a virus. And the places where we've been most successful at quelling the virus or stopping the virus have used top down heavy-handed government approaches of limiting personal freedom. Um, and uh, that's just a really interesting thought, where other types of change is often sort of only possible through bottom-up pushes on, on existing power structures. Um, questions about what we mean when we talk about social change? Cool. Hey, here's a here's a big slide. Uh, I made this diagram. Uh, so, uh, you know, take it or leave it. But uh, I'm with this. I, I think trying to capture all of the pieces of society. And so I think you'll see kind of the the different items that you were throwing out in the word bubble in question one uh, uh, captured here. Right, and thinking about right, if social change is the patterns, if the changing patterns of economic behavior, social norms, cultural values and practices, and human environmental interactions, what the hell causes that to change over time? Um, and I think for those of us uh, that are sort of paying attention, we we realize that there isn't one thing and one thing only that leads to a society or 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 social change occurring. Right. It's everything from your inner self and your inner life and how that affects your relationships in your community and everything from social movements and democracy and legal systems uh, to government policy. And then how we educate people in our society 
and how that feeds into science, innovation, and technology, and then how we use those technologies to influence our economic systems and markets, uh, and how that overlaps and intertwines with arts and culture, and the role of media and changing media technologies in influencing those processes, which which are all connected back to inner life, relationships, community, and it's a it's a, an interconnected web of things that are happening. And it's one giant process of meaning making, right? It's one giant process of 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 assigning shared values to different components of of society. Um, and so I just want to take a minute on the next slide to ask the question about this diagram and something you can think about maybe as you plan your presentations that you're going to give to that you're going to give to to the to the to the group moving forward is like where is your organization on this flowchart right like where where is your organization working in uh, are they focused with community building are they focused on uh, education are they focused on a uh, shifting government policy? Uh, are they focused on arts and culture? Are they focused on media? Uh, and it's important to think about like, like once you've identified that, that like, that like there are other organizations doing other things on that sphere, potentially on that issue, right? Um, uh, and then I think for yourself, you can also ask like what you personally feel called to work on, right? Like, what is your inner philosophy about how change happens in the world, right? Uh, are you someone who believes that science and innovation and education are, like, the key? Uh, uh, are you somebody who believes that, like, building radical social movements to overthrow bad government is the thing that we need? Are you somebody who wants to open up the ideas and possibilities of social change through arts and culture and media? Um, and they're all valuable, right? Like that's how we really shift societies when 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 the when when our visions for change start to enter all of these different spheres and nodes, that's when we really start to see big shifts. So that's why it's important that we think about think about our calling and the work that we want to do as as change makers and as leaders, and think about how that overlaps and interacts and connects with other people doing other work in other parts of that system of change, if that makes sense. I'm gonna spend two seconds here, I'm biting into Kate's time now, but this is another kind of way of, of conceptualizing uh, uh, change philosophies. There's sort of a spectrum of, of philosophies of, of change when, we, when you look at the environmental uh, sustainability literature, uh, right, there's like, the neoliberal environmentalism philosophy, which says that uh, b basically that like, you know, just assumes that the free market will always be there, that capitalism is the natural operating state of humanity, and that uh, uh, individuals are responsible for making change. Um, um, all the way down to the bottom, what we have what might be called eco-localism or sustainable degrowth, uh, where collective action is needed uh, uh, to, to transform into new systems and, and environmental, uh, new systems of economic practice um, that can sort of drastically change the way we're doing business. I did want to show you these videos, but they're, they're, they're two clips at, for a total of seven minutes. They're from a movie that is now 20 years old. It's one of my favorites, The Matrix. Um, you got to show one of them. Y you open this with The Matrix. We, we were going to see The Matrix. Maureen agrees with me. And now we've just lost you entirely. Instead of watching it, we're just going to awkwardly stare at each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, maybe. 
Uh, I'm gonna fill time. Did we lose Joe? I'm gonna fill time. So I want everyone to know that uh, I met Maureen when we were phone canvassing. I think that's the first time I met. Yeah, I think so too. We were phone canvassing for Leah Gazan, and you know who's calling me right now? Oh, I hope it's Leah Gazan. Joseph Washley Solis. Oh, I'm telling your, your group about um, about Maureen's amazing phone skills. Okay, I'm just gonna take over. All right. Wow, good timing. Okay, okay. Joe has a fire in his apartment. He needs to go to the hospital. I'm just kidding. He's uh, <laughs> his internet is broken. Whew, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. But um, okay, so we were uh, phone canvassing for League of Van. Marine, was it your your was that your house or was it somebody else's house? No, it, it was, well, I think it was my house, yeah, a few times, and then, um, so, uh, house. anyway, Maureen, you know, so phone canvassing, if you've never done this before, it's calling strangers that you've never met before and asking them to do something political, right? Like, what is the most uncomfortable thing for people to do these days? Something political. And, you know, Maureen just like just went through the list and was the as you can imagine, the most friendly, the most comfortable person on the phone. And you know, it's so nice to be around that when you're phone canvassing because everyone kind of needs a boost. Like it's hard. It's hard to do. And so if you're hearing someone else being just like chipper and cool and calm and eating pizza on the side, like Everything still was great. So the part that Kate doesn't know is that before I did it for cool things like candidates that I really believe in, I also like sold knives over the phone for a while. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's maybe why I I got better at it. Hard to sell knives over the phone. You're the best. That's so great. It's really nice to see you again. I think Maureen can also tell you teach you about growing food if they haven't mentioned already. So lots of things you can learn from this person. Uh, my name is Kate Schoberg. I want to start, um, you know, I taught a class for three hours this afternoon. I know many of you are students and you're like looking at screens for the whole day. And in another lifetime, I taught yoga and these days I teach meditation. So we're going to do a little bit of something, something right now. I'm going to turn to the side and I'm going to kind of like walk you through. I want you to like breathe into your body and feel your spine extend from your tailbone all the way up through your lumbar spine, through your mid spine, through your upper back into your shoulders, across the back of your shoulders. And then I really want you to feel how the back of your neck can extend up. And as the back of your neck extends, feel that there's like a tuck in your chin and your your jaw actually goes back a little bit often because most of us, I'm doing this all day long, right? So you can start to feel how actually your jaw goes back so that your core, your, so that the back of your head can extend up. And it's almost like there's a, you know, I'm pulling on my hair up towards the ceiling. So as you're like nice and strong and upright like that, if that feels good to you now, start to breathe into your belly. Feel your belly soften and really like accept the air that's being sent down there. Feel how your rib cage, if you want to, can extend actually in all directions. It's not just like forwards and backwards, right? The, the rib cage ex expands to the sides as well. And when you're on your inhale, also feel how the air can go all the way up to your collarbones and even past your collarbones on the inhale. So stay really nice and grounded and upright. And now start to feel that your exhale becomes slower. You guys are so awesome. And now start to feel that your exhale is taking longer than your inhale. In a relaxed way. So not in a way where you're like, now rushing the inhale, right? But just that kind of your exhale becomes slower and slower. So stay with that vibe and now open your hands. 
And just place your hands on opposite shoulders and now like grab hard into that muscle, right? And now grab a little bit lower, a little bit lower. Feel also like, don't just feel your hands offering the pressure, but feel like what it feels like in those forearms to be pressed, right? Into your wrists, hands. Very good. Maybe you want to, a really nice thing for me, I used to like play a lot of basketball and volleyball, is to feel my knees and to like squeeze my knee joints. For some reason that feels like so comforting to like squeeze my knees back together. I don't know. I don't know what that's about. But maybe you want to do that to your ankles as well if you're able to. So listen, while I'm talking, I'm going to talk for a while. You're welcome to like stretch. You're welcome to stand up. You're welcome to do squats. You know, like we're so stationary now and I can't believe it when I think about the students that I teach being on Zoom in the same position for like eight hours a day. Uh, I don't expect you to do that. It's, it's such a gift that your, your videos are on right now for me. Like it's so lovely to see your faces. But don't feel like you need to be stationary. So I've been, for, I got to talk to my 90 year old uncle on Tuesday night. And his older brother is my grandpa. So my old, my grandpa died. But when I get to talk to my uncle Don, I get to think about like the family that he and my grandpa grew up with in. And, and also think about their ways of speaking. So, like, my grandpa and grandma are, they were Swedish, and they were also rural Manitobans in Westman. And when we were playing uh, cards, and, like, my grandma got a really bad hand, she would say things like, Usha! Or if, like, if the, if the, uh, if the hand went really well, and it was, or it was a really good game, someone would say, Varsa good. So I know there's some Minnesotans in here who will like recognize that kind of language. But what I wanted to invite just to start is I would love to hear about someone that you love so much that offers like an interesting turn of phrase in another language or in English, whatever that is. And if you're willing to share that word and how they use it contextually, and also something about them, if, if you'd like. I would love to hear that as, as an introductory point. I, I, I got one. Uh, my best friend, uh, she, she uses the turn of phrase, you're not wrong, all the fucking time. Sorry, all the time. <laughs> Like, like I have a good idea or like a good insight into her life, and I'm like, yo, and I say it, and then she's like, you're not wrong, which is like <laughs> her way of being like, like I I agree, but or like yes, and and she's uh she's like a crazy go getter type A perfectionist, but has a heart of gold. You're not wrong. Very good. Versa good. I have one. Um, my grandmother. Um, when my mom was born, my grandpa was in the Canadian military, but stationed in Germany. So she learned a bit of German. Um, and I'm not sure if it was like local slang or if it's legitimate German, but she would say, such max do. And that would be like, what's wrong? And she had like a, a bit of different ones like that, but yeah. Very nice. Just part of my childhood and part of my mom and her story. Amazing. Anyone else want to share? One more, one more. So it's so it's so interesting, uh, you know, uh, jo Joe's intro to this was perfect in terms of 
a number of the things I want to talk about. And I realized when he mentioned that I'm starting it off with Louis Riel that a lot of what I want to talk about is is how we make like how we get grounded in the real. Real real. Okay, so sorry. Um, but you know, part of what we're working with, especially right now, are conspiracy theories and ways of understanding the world that are not real, but that are getting in the way of what actually needs to be done. And we've seen that in the states to the south of us. We're seeing that here in Manitoba in a lot of ways. So, you know, um, we, we need to, um, Sometimes the work of activists is to show people what is real and what's not before you can even get to what needs to change. And so some of what I'm going to talk about today is that. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. I think, um, Joe, are you going to uh, show the slides or no? Yeah, I'm back. Um, sorry, folks, the Internet fully crashed there a moment ago. Uh, I will share the slides, and you can just say like next slide, Kate, if you want, and I'll I'll uh, I'll make it happen. That is lovely. Oh, you wanted me to tell me tell people about me a little bit too. Maybe I'll yeah. Do that. If, I, if I could go back, I was gonna just say watch the Matrix and think about how you have the power to change systems once you realize what's actually happening, and as Kate says, understand the real and not made up theories about life. And then I was going to introduce Kate and say she is near and dear to my heart, someone I've learned a lot from, someone who is a badass community organizer and activist with a whole lot of experience working in a lot of different contexts and places. And we're all very lucky to have her here. Uh, and then I was going to pass it to you. Thank you, brother. Um, yeah, it's such a pleasure. Such a pleasure to be here. Um, so... You know, uh, Joe, Joseph told me that you had someone talk to you about the power of story. So you could actually turn off the slides just for the moment. And I'll, t I'll tell you one way that I think about my life that maybe helps you understand me a little bit. Um, so as I said, I have Swedish ancestors on my dad's side. Uh, those folks got here just around the turn of the century, 1905-ish. And uh, they left Sweden because the history of uh, agricultural policy in Sweden had changed a few generations back and changed from a communal structure to, uh, to uh, an individual family land ownership structure. And, you know, at first that probably made a lot of sense. But as families grew and the plots of land that they had been given um, essentially needed to keep getting divided up as families had children who needed their own plots of land. It became impossible for individual families to grow enough food and make enough money based on the land that they had. And so people needed to make a decision about what happened next. And uh, I've been told that that's not the only economic situation that encouraged lots of Sweden, Swedes to leave at that time. Uh, uh, but it was an economic situation that forced a decision. So I'm, I'm kind of like panning out a little bit because there's, there's a repetitive theme that's going to happen a couple times in this story. So they came, uh, to, uh, Western Manitoba, uh, just after, like, just after the time that the treaty in that area had been negotiated. And so people that had enjoyed the land that they farmed on, and actually, like, my my family uh, received land along uh, in, in an area of Manitoba where there's Little Scandinavia and there's Scandinavia Road. And so this was a place where a number of Swedes ended up. And uh, just close to there is the Rolling River Reserve. There's Wayweese Capo First Nation. There's Kisi Kuin First Nation. So the folks that are part of those First Nations now enjoyed the land that, uh, that we farmed on, um, and that was stolen from them through the treaty making process. And so, and so that had liter that was literally like kind of still underway 
as my grandparents were settling. Now, the story about them coming there is is horrendous, as as it was for many uh, settling families, whether Swedish or Mennonite or Ukrainian. There was a lot of death in those early years. There was no health care like we enjoy now. They had to pay for any visits to the doctor. Um, and so even though they were uh, invited here as a part of like the state building effort, um, they still had to fend for themselves in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm mapping out like the complexity of the situation. Land has been stolen from Indigenous folks who have uh, lost all rights or, and are under a process of genocide. Uh, my family receiving the privilege of the land that they that those folks had just been removed, like violently removed from, um, and struggling themselves. And then and then we advance uh, one generation ahead, two generations ahead. Um, and my my mom and dad in the 80s before I was born, uh, had moved to the city for school. They met in university and uh, and fell in love and got married. And I was born and we moved back to, to the farm where all of my dad's family had farmed. And it was in the 80s when uh, the interest rates went through the roof. And so if any of your families are farm families, we all experienced the same thing at that time, which is, um, you know, my dad was work, working as a few pharmaceutical rep during the day and he was on the combine at night and his entire pharmaceutical job salary, which was a good salary at that, at that time, all of it went into paying the interest rates on the farm. Uh, and there was nothing left. And, and by the time we moved to the farm, my, my mom and dad ended up having two boys there, my brothers. And so they were in a situation of bankruptcy. And so in the 80s, there was another wave of movement that happened where farm families from across South, southern Manitoba had the same experience as us and, and had to make a choice. And so we moved to the city. And we moved to the city at the same time as a number of Indigenous families were moving to the city because conditions on the reserves were not conducive to good lives either. Uh, as you know, Indigenous folks when living on reserve have very few opportunities for making money. There's very many restrictions about how property is used, whether people have access to property. Um, there's almost no uh, access to education, especially at that time. And often living conditions are, um, are horrendous. And so waves of Indigenous folks were moving, especially from the 50s but to the 80s and, of course, afterwards, were moving to the city. But, you know, my family moved to River Heights, which is an area of the city where you've got to have some money to be able to buy a home. And my parents didn't have a lot of money at that point. They were going bankrupt, but they were able to buy, to, to borrow um, dollars from other people and also to use the farm that they held as collateral in order to purchase a home and purchase a home in River Heights. Whereas Indigenous people moving to the city did not come with any manner of capital because of how the reserve structure, uh, reserve uh, uh, is structured, but also um, because of how the Indian Act has uh, um, in many ways obliterated people's rights. Um, they faced redlining from real estate agents and uh, landlords who were outright racist and would not work with Indigenous people and would prevent Indigenous people from living in certain areas of the city. Um, and they also often came, like, not just with, like, no capital, but no money at all. And so we're forced to live in, uh, in like, very, very cheap housing um, in communities where uh, a lot of other people were experiencing a lot of poverty. And so... It is very, uh, very much possible, you know, some of my background is doing anti-poverty work. It's very possible for low-income communities to create strong uh, networks of, of mutual support with one another. Um, we, we shouldn't uh, fall under the belief that uh, an extreme, a, a community that's poor is going to automatically be suffering 
problems like violence and gangs and these kinds of things. But when there's ongoing um, oppression and disruption and also um, and also uh, not just when I say disruption, I'm talking about like CFS involvement in families and police uh, racially profiling people. Um, it causes it causes extreme challenges for people to maintain those relationships of mutual support among families in the same neighborhood. And so and so indigenous families who moved at the, to the city at the same time as my family. And we might say for the very same reasons to have a better life. Had a very different experience in my family. Had. Um, I mean, the other difference about River Heights is the schools there are considered really great. And in other areas of the city, like the neighborhood I live in now, uh, like Point Douglas, um, the schools uh, are not, that's not a school that people across the city want to send their kids to. So um, so what I observed in coming to Winnipeg very quickly, especially because I was in sport, I was like played so many sports growing up. And when you play sport, you get to know different areas of the city because you go and you play soccer at other people's fields. You go to other people's gyms to play basketball. I started to notice, uh, even though I didn't know this when we first moved to the city, I was six. But as I grew up and started to see, I was like, oh, like, the city is really segregated. Like, it's it's unmistakable. You can't ignore it. But that was not necessarily something I ever heard talked about. Um and I was just like really curious about it and curious about how, you know, when I went to Kelvin and I had a lot of friends that I played basketball with that were Filipino and they they had grown up going to St. John's or, or Sisler, like they would have gone there if they didn't go to Kelvin. I'd go to their homes and their homes were completely different from the friends' homes that I had in River Heights. And so there's just all this confirmation all the time, like this city is so segregated. So I wondered about that. But in terms of like these ongoing uh, disruptions in my own family that have happened over time. So the Swedes coming to Canada and then us moving from the farmland to the city. I've personally witnessed two times where even though my family was in a very, very vulnerable state, we ended up uh, in a much more secure state than Indigenous people. And, and often our privilege was directly related to Indigenous families' uh, uh, oppression. Like those two stories were happening hand in hand. And, and what I've wondered over time is when will be the next time that there will need to be like some kind of, what, what will it be? Will it be a mass migration? Will it be a disruption? And can I act in my life to be humble enough in my white body, in my white cellar body, to, uh, to act in a way that, uh, that is better for everyone? Where my indigenous brothers and sisters, where I'm, I'm working just as hard for them as I am for my own, myself and my family so that we can all have a better community together. Um, I don't know, I don't, maybe this, maybe the pandemic is this next destruction that I, that I kind of wondered about. I have to say in my own life, I haven't done enough work to make sure that we're all gonna, we're all gonna um, come out of this better. You know, indigenous families are doing a lot worse than white families in Winnipeg right now. So, um, so there's all, all manner of reason to keep pushing at this, uh, at our decolonial project, as at our anti anti oppression projects, at all of this stuff, you know. So um, it's a little bit about me. Let's go to the slides. So my first, the first bit that I wanted to talk about is Louis Riel. Louis Riel. The anniversary of his execution is last week. Louis Riel was, uh, for a time, the leader of the Métis. They had a number of leaders before him. And 
Um, I wanted to talk about him because I wanted to talk about a few things. For one thing, we need to know that many leaders have had visions for this particular piece of land that we're all on, that were inclusive and that we're in good relationship with the land. And when I say in good relationship with the land, I'm not talking about like an object that's static. Like I'm talking about the land also being something that is changing and, and you know, adapting to us and we're adapting to the land all at the same time. So um, so I think it's worth it to not just commemorate Louis Riel as like an amazing rebel, uh, not a rebel, but a resistor but also as a visionary who mapped out how how actually many people from many different places in the world could live in a good way together here. I'm going to say a little bit from this book uh, by Jean Tayette. I really recommend it. So um, this is just before, um, this, is, this is in the 1860s, and Louis Riel was hung in, I think, 1871. So the Métis work in Red River. So Red River is the name for the place that was here before Winnipeg. Uh, the Métis work in Red River and in the broader landscape here into the west and to the south was one of constant creation and resistance. In the very late 1860s, as they were resisting invasion and takeover by the Canadian government, they formed the National Council and then the uh, Provisional Council the provisional government, sorry. They were constantly debating and constantly taking votes on the next step. And when I say debating, you know, there were a few groups at play. There was the French Métis, there was the English Métis, uh, there was an Ojibwe chief involved in these uh, groups for a time, Henry Prince. Um, uh, so all just trying to figure out like how, b both how do we live together and how do we resist this invasion? They formed documents of rights and ways of being with one another. And Louis Riel and the people he was working with were constantly, again, in this work of creation and resistance. Their strategies included political organizing, stacking meetings, uh, direct action, peaceful resistance, armed struggle, and celebration. They joked and they laughed a lot. They wrote songs shaming their adversaries. They believed that they had, some, they had something, they had something that deserved protection something specific to this place in the world, something worth developing, and something they knew that the Canadians to the East did not understand. It was very real, and it was very relational. It was also very land-based. So in her book, Jean Tayette notes that the ways that the Métis dealt with Thomas Scott. So Thomas Scott ended up being a key player in what led to Louis Riel's uh, death. Um, he was in prison for a while for killing someone, and he was just an all-around, like, just surly character anyway when they when they needed to decide what they were going to do with him after they imprisoned him they worked with a mix of justice practices sourced from english french ojibwe and and cree justice traditions metis law of the prairies uh, was also influencing how they worked with thomas scott and and these are practices that the metis had built up over years of buffalo hunting so this meant that the aim of the trial work on Scott wasn't simply to find evidence and prove guilt, but was also to restore relationships and community dynamics. In other words, many people, including Riel. So when I say many people, I'm also talking about the people who, tr who signed Treaty Number no. 1. You know, all of the chiefs who came to sign Treaty Number no. 1 at the Stone Fort came with the intention of figuring out how to live together and with the active... Um, the active desire to figure that out. So, and, and with, I think that there, even though those were very different processes, um, I think there is a thread line in, in the intention, especially from indigenous leaders in the 1860s and 1870s, um, to vision a way of being together in this place in ways that support everyone benefiting from the abundance of the land, everyone living well together. And so I, I really think about how I can rely on those visions, even as we incarnate kind of our own visions of what we want to be doing going forward. So uh, slide, please. 
Mr. Washley Silies. Now, I wanted to take a moment to talk about what does it take to win. Joe and I and Maureen uh, worked on League of Zan's campaign. I'm going to talk about that later. Um, and this was, and I've done a lot of like, you know, big like party organizing. What does it take to win? There's often a misconception among people new to like um, governmental politics that you need a majority in order to win. And there's often a misconception that when you're initiating like uh, an organizing project in the community in order, in order to change policy that you need a majority of the people to agree with you in order to win. You don't. You need a majority of the voters who have the power to vote on that issue to win. So as we know, many people choose not to vote in elections, right? Um, as we know, sometimes like our houses of government are populated by more than two parties. And so what politics is often is a math game. Um, and it's often a math game to figure out now, how can we get um, just enough votes to uh, to make the thing happen that we want to? So I'm going to talk about this idea in a bit of a cynical way. It's important to think about this idea in a positive way when there's when there's particular policy that you're aiming for. And and I've done that in different ways in other in other examples. But um, I want to talk about how ideas can go bad in the context of not needing, you know, the majority of all of the people in a landscape to vote for you. Joe, your your comments are coming in right now. Just go back to that last slide one more time. So in Manitoba, for a long time, we had an NDP government. And they were voted in after conservative government had done very similar destruction to what the conservative government is doing now. And so there was a lot of relief among people when they were first elected. But you can imagine that after that first push of organizing to get rid of a really bad government, a government needs to start to talk about why um, a population should keep them around. And so um, stories can be used to secure just the amount of votes that you need to grab the election. And you know, I watched, I was working in the inner city in the 2008 election, the 2012 election. And I watched the NDP at that time use fear-based politics in order to convince the voters from the suburbs, of which there are many, like, you know, the, the biggest, the highest voting population, the ones that you can count on voting the most times, are the folks in the suburbs. In Manitoba, and in Manitoba, we're talking about the Winnipeg suburbs. Like, Winnipeg suburbs uh, hold a lot of power in elections. And so, you know, there was a time when we didn't have a, a helicopter for the police in Winnipeg. And in one of those elections, um, it's true that there was a surge in violence at that time in our in some of our communities. But the city, the, the NDP really exploited, and, and um, municipal politicians have done that as well, had, had exploited that situation. Um, and the fear that, the racist fear that the suburbs had of what was going on in the inner city. And they said, listen, we're going to, we're going to buy, we're going to pay for more cops for the city of Winnipeg government. And we're going to buy a helicopter. To, sell, to, to help the Winnipeg Police Service um, deal with the crime that's happening. And they managed to win that election. And overall, the NDP winning elections is probably good for the most amount of people. So that's not a debate that I want to, uh, that I want to enter into. But I want to talk about, like, the fallout of making of, of choices like that in terms of like entertaining those kinds of, of stories uh, that only get at part of uh, part of the idea of what's going on. 
So we'll go to the next slide now. So this is a really helpful, um, helpful uh, bit of information from a, a trans artist, activist, uh, art performer, writer, Alok Minan. And they, and his, uh, sorry, her, actually, I don't know what their gender is. I'm very sorry. But you can see their handle uh, on Instagram, and I really encourage you to follow them. So Jonathan Metzel, it, so Alok's been doing uh, book reports on really, really helpful content around, especially politics in the U.S. And they did a book report on dying of whiteness how the politics of racial resentment is killing Americans' heartland. So the book is written by Jonathan Metzl, and, and he says, so he reviews data to show how despite the fact that polluting the environment, cutting away healthcare programs, and relaxing gun laws results in increased death rates of death for working class white people. Many still support these policies. Metzl conducts interviews and focus groups with white working class Trump supporters, highlighting how they are willing to put their own lives on the line in support of their political beliefs. In other words, they are willing to die for their whiteness or would rather sink the whole ship rather than rise all times. Rather than an act of self-sabotage, this is viewed as an act of noble self-denial a sacrifice for a whole year cause. So we'll go to the next slide. So, you know, before the pandemic, before Trump, we already were living in a context of white supremacy. We we're already living in a context of capitalism and colonialism. And all of these structures love diversion tax ta tactics and they love, they love kind of storytelling and fantasy weaving. Um, but, and we're still, we're clearly seeing, you know, kind of fantasies being brought up in, in Manitoba right now with people walking into emergency rooms to criticize the healthcare system and question masks wearing in the middle of a pandemic. The rise of conspiracy theories and panic over false claims of human trafficking. So uh, if you've heard of the QAnon conspiracies in the States. Um, but meanwhile, the pandemic is real. Meanwhile, government and industry violation of treaties and Supreme Court laws protecting Indigenous people is real. Meanwhile, government failure vis-a-vis -vis housing, income, and health provisions are real. And the consequences of all of these decisions are very, very real. But it's like everything that I put in that last bullet that, you know, um, governments all the time try to avoid talking about or wash over um, in the interest of talking about something that does not get does not met so much responsibility on their shoulders. We'll go to the next slide. So how do we get to the real? This is an important question for us as people who are interested in one another's well-being people interested in community, people interested in justice. So we have really good examples of how do we get to the real. One, one example that comes to mind is Indigenous women's leadership in Winnipeg. So some of the people I learned the most from when it comes to thinking about our community, politics, the world, are Indigenous women, especially Nahani Fontaine, who was as with the Southern Chiefs Organization of, as their justice coordinator uh, when I was in university, and Leslie Spillett, who is founded Ganiganichik, whose daughter is Tasha Spillett, who's a PhD uh, author and educator and organizer. And um, what especially Nahani Fontaine did, so at the time, I want you to imagine this, because this is different than your reality now. At the time, Indigenous women were going missing all the time, but no one was talking about it. People had to fight to get the stories into the paper. If, if it was talked about in the paper, the women were often blamed for their own demise. 
the the police were not dealing, were not responding to families when their family member was going missing. Like it was, the situation is good, not good now, but it was it was way different then. We hadn't had the inquiry. Okay, so I have to say, uh, I watched Nahani Fontaine, especially single handedly, take the media to task and educate them on the issue and also how to explain the issue. Um, and she did it just doggedly, like one by one. She would go after reporters who had reported on the issue and educate them on what they'd gotten wrong. She would go after news organizations that didn't talk about the issue at all and ask them why. Um, I, I want to talk about, <coughs> sorry, my dog is just very excited. Um, so the other thing that I was introduced to if it's getting too loud, just let me know. I'm just going to keep going. Um, in university, I was introduced to vigils and the Trans Day of Remembrance is this Friday. That was the first vigil that I went to where I, I real, I, first of all, I was like, Oh, we have to have vigils for, for some people because their families abandoned them. Like what happened here, right? But then the other thing that that was clear is that with with wrongful deaths the point of a vigil was had so many meanings. So one was to recognize that this person had a life and a life that mattered. In a context where, in, 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 in such a culture of violence, in a culture of erasure, in their life, they may have been like ignored by the dominant culture. So it's so powerful in a vigil situation because vigils are public events, right? They're not just for the family. They're not just for close friends. Often vigils happen out in the open in a public park or or some other like public space. It's about making a public uh a public statement like this person mattered. And then with with indigenous led vigils right after someone died, often died by violence, or when it was noted that uh a woman had disappeared and something needed to happen. Universities when I started to be invited to vigils for these women. And at those ones, especially the media would be invited and whoever was supporting the family. And often it was Nahani Fontaine in her role with the Southern Chiefs organization. She would educate the media in the context of both taking care of the family who had lost someone, but say like, this needs to be covered. We need to be talking about this and we need to move this issue forward. So I want you to think about the legacy of, like vigils and public mourning being political acts that act against the erasure of a real person and val and really value their life in the public sphere, but also create a political conversation about what needs to change. Uh, Nahani and other women offered direct support for families and bringing families together. And so when I talk about what is real? What is real is our, 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 our relationships. What is real is a person who existed and then died. What is real is the support that we offer to one another in times of crisis. Um, so, so, uh, Nahani was, uh, constantly offering direct support to families and also bringing families together. Families who had lost loved ones so that they could exchange support to one another and, and so that they had someone else around that they knew had experienced the same thing. I talked about her direct engagement with the media and, you know, she built this work over the, over time. She also had direct engagement with, with the police, the RCMP in terms of actually changing their practices when it came to responding to families who had lost someone. 
And, you know, Nahani's cross-country activism in concert with other leaders from other provinces, you know, built this national momentum towards a public inquiry. And, you know, not all families wanted an inquiry. There's there's controversy about that. But um, but when we say, how do we get to the real, the, the issue of murder and missing Indigenous women is an issue that, you know, prior to this work, our kind of white supremacist situation wanted to pretend that that issue was not real. And so the process that I just described to you was one of making the issue real. And now, and just now, we're in the, we're in the process of, say, of saying like, okay, what do we need to do to change so that this doesn't happen anymore? Right? We're just at the beginning of that process. Okay, next slide. How do we get to the real land and water protectors across Turtle Island? You know, with, you know, people who are doing that work with their bodies, what's real? My body, your body. Going at, and, you know, being at the Onistoten, uh camp, being at Standing Rock with, with the body, saying, what do we need to survive? It's this water right here. What, it, what does my body need? It's, it's the food that is grown on this land. It's the animals that have been in relationship to this specific place for generations and generations. So what am I doing? I'm here to protect this place because my body belongs to this place. This place belongs to my body. Intertwined. And what Indigenous people tell us is it's not just the individual's relationship with that landscape, but it's the entire culture's relationship to that landscape. That's what happened with the buffalo hunt, buffalo hunt that I talked about earlier that informed Métis justice making. Okay? So I'm not saying that I'm Indigenous. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that we all have a relationship with the land that we're on. And and being in good relationship with the land and the people around us is another way of reminding ourselves what is real. What is real? Is it the story that we're being told that, like, one more fracking project isn't going to matter? Or is it the story being told by the person whose water is downstream from that fracking project that, like, I'm not going to be able to drink this water if that fracking project happens? Right? Um, let's go to the next slide. So there's so many ways that we create the real and create the world. Indigenous folks have, in the context of genocide, protected, kept safe, and, and are now somehow remembering through like ancestral lineage, traditions, practices, cultures, and are now carrying them forward and like crafting and gifting those, those cultures to the modern world, like, and actively crafting the world. This is real. The, we also know about the world building of black trans women and trans people of color, of queer communities that informs so much of the art that like, you know, in our pop culture that we consume. But these are like real worlds that have been created, that are being lived out, that are the full expressions of people's, you know, beauty. We have the theory and practice that people with disabilities are gifting the world, prioritizing care, valuing, and celebrating bodies in all of our forms, making space for everyone's life, enjoyment, pleasure, safety, and well-being. I think it's also important as, like, activists, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the next slide, that we really consider pleasure as real, that we push back against like this capitalist notion of scarcity and that we need to be in, co in competition against one another. 
you know, I'm looking at Mar Marines, one of the few faces I can see right now. Farmers, growers know about the abundance of the land, of the ongoing gifts of the land. And that really it's just a problem of sharing that we have. It's not a problem of scarcity. Con so consider abundance. Um, and let's really, for me, more and more and more, activism and organizing need to be seen as machines of joy, relationship, and connection. They need to be seen as world building. Let's go to the next slide. So, Adrian Marie Brown, I just about lost my laptop there. Um, Marine's not a lazy gardener. I'm a lazy gardener. Um, and I just watch my backyard grow squash for me every year that I get to eat. And that is for me, I think, I, I want to encourage you to, all of you to think about what is the, the heart trick, the mental trick that, that, that reminds you that scarcity is a lie. For me, it's going into the garden every year, even though I'm shit at it. Because no matter how bad if I am at growing things, it always grows. Something always grows. Um, and that is a reminder that this land wants us. This land wants us. This land wants you. It wants to support you. And then we are told all of these things about how we have to compete one another to get enough money to buy a house and to whatever. Blah, 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 blah. That is an economy that humans have built that is separate from what I think the land is telling us all the time. And we get to choose which story we believe and which which story we work towards. So I just want you to keep that in mind. Adrian Marie Brown, lovely, lovely person, very active on Instagram. I totally encourage you to follow her. I'm going to read a little bit of her book here. This is called Pleasure Activism. Um, these are her beliefs. I believe that all organizing is science fiction, that we are shaping the future we long for and have not yet experienced. I believe that we are in an imagination battle, and almost everything about how we orient our bodies is shaped by fearful imaginations, imaginations that fear blackness, brownness, fatness, queerness, disability, and dis difference. Our ra radical imagination is a tool for decolonization, for reclaiming our right to shape our lived reality. I believe that we are part of a natural world that is constantly changing and we need to learn to adapt together to stay in relationship if we hope to survive as a species. I believe in transformative justice that rather than punishing people for surface level behavior or restoring conditions to where they were before the harm happened, we need to find the roots of the harm together and make the harm impossible in the future. I believe that the roots of most harm are systemic. And we must be willing to disrupt the vicious systems that have been normalized. I believe that we are at the beginning of learning how to really practice transformative justice in this iteration of species and society. There is ancient practice and there will be, there, there will need to be future practices we can't yet foresee. But I believe that with time, it must become an incredible pleasure to be able to be honest, expect to be whole, and to know that we are in a community that will hold us accountable and change with us. I am in this practice in as many spaces as I can be in my life. I believe that transformative justice is actually a crucial element in moving towards the kind of large scale societal healing we need. Transformative justice is a way we can be begin to believe that the harm that has come to us won't keep happening, that we can uproot it, and that we can seed some new ways of being with one another. I also believe that I am not creating the ideas in this book, but observing a beautiful pattern of pleasure, shifting the ground beneath us, inside us, and transforming what is possible between us. I have learned from so many teachers, living and dead. To that end, I have an extended section of this book 
that is lineage, tracing the streams that are flowing into this particular river in ways that I hope create common ground between you and me. I want to read also what she says, what is pleasure activism? Sorry, ple pleasure principles. So I think these are good directions for all of us. What you pay attention to grows. We, we become what we practice. Yes is the way. Here she has an example. When it was time to move to Detroit, when it was time to leave my last job, when it was time to pick up a meditation practice, time to swim, time to eat healthier, I knew because it gave me pleasure when I made and lived into the decision. Now I am letting that guide my choices for how I organize and for what I am aiming towards in my work. Pleasure in the processes of my existence and states of being. Yes is a future. When I feel pleasure, I know I am on the right track. Some more cues, she says. When I am happy, it is good for the world. The deepest pleasure comes from riding the line between commitment and detachment. Make justice and liberation feel good. She also says, your no makes the way for your yes. In other words, boundaries create the container within which your yes is authentic. Being able to say no makes yes a choice. And finally, she says, moderation is key. The idea is not to be in a heady state of ecstasy at all times, but rather to learn how to sense when something is good for you, to be able to feel what enough is. Related to this, she says, pleasure is not money. Pleasure is not even related to money, at least not in a positive way. Having resources to buy unlimited amounts of pleasure leads to excess, and excess totally destroys the spiritual experience of pleasure. Next slide. So I want to ask, what is your theory of change? And make space for all of the options. So make space for everyone to do what they can, what they're interested in. Find ways to value contributions and work extra hard to value the contributions that you don't understand. And I guess what I'm revealing with that slide is that um, there, we can talk about so many methods of change making, direct action, um, growing food, political organizing, uh, running for politics. Um, for me, like I value and I'm grateful for all of those forms. I'm not a purist. Um, and I, I believe, and, and I'm, I not a lot, I'm not sure that a lot of people believe or agree with me on this, but, but that actually so many ways of making change are so complementary, even when the actors in those different forms aren't communicating with one another and even don't want to communicate with one another. Next slide. Also make space for the possibility that you can win in unpredictable ways. I'm, I'm bringing this example up. This is my friend, uh, Sharon Johnson has the red lipstick and Alexa used to run the mama bear clan. Last summer, the, the city said that they wanted to uh, contract with someone to tear down tents that were on the riverbanks. And um, Sharon, especially Sharon, uh, led a, a massive and very quick organizing feat that, you know, I'm sure some of you were involved with. I was involved with. Um, and they they did the typical things like they had a, a petition. Um, what they're holding in that picture is a stack of signatures that they had just taken to City Hall. They held a. Uh, at least one rally, but there might have been more than that. Um, and they they pressured the government through media. Now, they got a, a, a meeting with Mayor Bowman, 
and Sharon and Alexa went together. And this is them just coming out of that meeting, actually, that photo. And the 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 assumption was, the hope was that because they had brokered support for canceling that RFP from dozens of nonprofit, well-respected organizations, from hundreds of people who signed that petition, they they figured that that amassing that amount of pressure would be what would get the government to cancel the plan, if anything would. But what happened in the meeting is, and if ever you meet Sharon, you should ask her this story because she's such an amazing storyteller, is Sharon went through the, the, through the RFP line by line and explained to the mayor, who is a lawyer, how many of the lines in that, in that request for proposals would create legal impossibilities for either the contractor or the city or both. And it was only after she went through that exercise that he looked at his staff and said, well, why are we going through with this? And so I guess I want to just say, like, um, you know, the mayor, I don't know if I don't know why at that point in time he tried to he decided to cancel it. My read on that is. As a lawyer, he had someone speaking his language to him. He didn't care about public pressure. He didn't care what the nonprofits thought. But when someone told him what the legal problem was, he was like, okay, it's off the table. So that is not what Alexa and Sharon expected would happen. But that's what happened. And that's why they look so elated in that photo. And I just want to say how monumental that win was. Governments don't cancel policy. It doesn't, it almost never happens, especially the municipal government. And in a two month span, Sharon, like, you know, got the signatures one by one, knocked on doors, called nonprofit organizations. And then she and Alexa planned to go to that meeting and debate the mayor and his, his cadre of, I think there were a dozen staff around the table. And they got a really violent um, uh, policy canceled, which is just uh, such an accomplishment. Next, next slide. Theories of change. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe you guys have like books that you treat like Bibles. This is one of the books, Wobblies and Zapatistas, that I find myself going back all the time. I especially find myself going back to this book when I'm kind of feeling like, what works in this situation or like, what do I do? This is a conversation between uh, Stoughton Lind, who is mostly a labor lawyer and activist and Andre Grubacek, who's an anarchist. And they go back and forth talking about different efforts to make change and it's personal storytelling and it's appreciative storytelling. So even though they come from very different kind of theoretical backgrounds, they appreciate one another's position and they appreciate one another's work. Now, I wanted to talk about one part of the book that talks about the Zapatistas and their approach in Mexico, uh, because I, I think, you know, I think a lot about this, uh, this way of thinking about politics. Um, and I think, I think it informs kind of the way that I think about things. So um, the Zapatistas, really came into action when NAFTA was signed, the North American Free Trade Agreement, because they believed that it would um, really hurt their community in Chiapas as agricultural workers. Um, and they were armed resistors and, you know, took up arms and, and um, you know, this is not nonviolent resistors, even though it, um, their leader, Marcos, um, is interested in being as peaceful as possible. But the, one of the key tenets of their work is um, leadership by obeying. So in other words, if you're a leader, you only lead by obeying 
what the people you are serving, the people you're leaving, the people you're serving are telling you to do. And so this means that even when they went to meetings that were like many villages away from where the leader lived, if the meeting that they were went to, if, if the agenda changed and it's not the agenda they planned for and it's not the agenda that they came to the meeting expecting to make decisions on. In other words, they hadn't yet had a conversation about that agenda item with their community. They would stop the meeting, go back home, talk through that agenda item, get direction on it from their people and then go back and go and have that meeting. Right. But I want to read a couple bits on uh, more about this way of thinking. Um, even though the, Z the Zapatistas had, they pressured all the way to the national government, they were taking on the national government, they decided that they did not want to take power and it's explained in a number of quotations in this narrative. So Marcos, again, is the leader of the Zapatistas. He says, we don't see ourselves as a vanguard and we don't want to take power. Thus, at the first massive encuentro, Marcos said that the Zapatistas had made a decision not to impose our point of view, that they rejected the doubtful honor of being the historical vanguard of the multiple vanguards that plague us. And finally, yes, the moment has come to say to everyone that we neither want nor, nor are we able to occupy the place that some hope we will occupy the place from which all opinions will come, all the answers, all the roots, all the truth. We are not going to do that. He's talking about taking the power of the government. Marcos then took the Mexican flag and gave it to the delegates, in effect telling them, it's your flag. Use it to make a democratic Mexico. We Zapatistas hope we have created some space within which you can act. So the narrator says, what? A left group that doesn't want to take state power? There must be a mistake. But no, he means it. And because it is a perspective so different from that uh, traditional in Marxism, because it represents a fresh synthesis of what is best in Marxist and anarchist traditions, I want to quote several more examples. In the fourth dec declaration, it is stated that the Zapatistas will be a political force that does not aspire to take power, that can organize citizens' demands and proposals so that he who commands, commands in obedience to the popular will. So he's talking about creating so much pressure on the government that they have to listen. So he's talking about imposing their way of organizing themselves on the national government and just creating the space so that their demands can be met, but they don't actually have to take state power. There's a few more examples. Yeah, I don't want to I don't want to repeat too much, but, you know, when I first read this, this was really helpful for thinking about, like, what are we trying to create? Do we want to just reinvent the wheel? Do we just want leftists to take power because we think that will be better? Um, or, or do we want to do something else with our organizing techniques? And um, and so I think the Zapatistas uh, offer a really interesting example. Next slide. Another person I want you to be aware of is Roberto Vargas. He wrote this book called Family Activism. And he he's um, a counselor and a facilitator. And he talks about making the family unit and your familial uh, relationships. So I'm talking about like your, your chosen family, your relations out in the community, and doing, doing the work to bring in love and trust an emotional connection and well-being and making space for that all the time. And so when we talk about bringing it back to the real, you know, having real conversations, I think, is a part of is part of this story, a part of the mix. So he says, view everyone as family, recognize that everyone you care about and who cares for you as family, care for family, support everyone and what they need for health, growth and happiness. You and your family model the change you desire to see in the world. Teach positive family power. Teach love and caring to create positive family power. And encourage vision and transformation. Advance social transformation through vision and personal change. Next slide. So 
So the other one, I, I'm going to ask Joe to share this video with you, and we're going to go to the next slide. Yeah. So uh, the video is linked in the document with all of the other links. Uh, we'll watch it later, uh, just like the Matrix clips. Great. Um, and I just wanted to mention this example, too, of a way that we make real and care for one another, because it's just so remarkable. Andrew Henderson uh, died in 2016. And he had a, he had cancer and it was cancer that killed him. And he knew that his death was coming and he created an art event, um, as a part of a, a funeral for himself while he was still alive, where he invited his friends to pick a symbol that represented a secret that they had that they'd never told anyone before that he would have tattooed on him at the party and essentially take to take to the grave with him. And the party was like a huge, like, like a, like a beautiful celebration, champagne, feathers, amazing DJs, like music and, and like all of the people he loved. And he came from small town Manitoba and came from a community where, you know, being queer was a hard, hard thing. And not just being queer, but being like this amazing artist, creative spirit. And part of what I want to talk about with Andrew Henderson is how he brought the full expression of Andrew Henderson forward in his life and also in his death and created these beautiful relationships in his act of dying and um and so you know on on the spectrum of what we see as polit political activism especially at a time when we can feel so di disconnected with one another I, I wanted to highlight that example next slide so what can we do from a strong base so i started talk by talking about like examples you know of love and relationality and creating trust with one another because that can be the grounding for all of the ways that we can make change, whether it's prefigurative economies like the ranch where I work now or farm to eater networks like it happened with the Harvest Moon Society or the Social Enterprise Center like you may learn about. Mutual aid um, and drag the red as like very direct kind of like what do we do that we need to happen now that the government is not doing for us. Direct action and political change, awareness and movement building. Um, one of you is talking about the the um, fasting at the ledge that happened recently. So that was, you know, for the children's special allowances. And then we can also make change to the courts, like Cindy Blast, Blackstock and the and the and child welfare. Um, I haven't made change to the, to the courts. That's not a uh, you know something that I've been involved with, but other areas of political work that are listed here and not um but they're all open you know and they all need to be valued in their own in their own right next slide so i wanted to talk about two examples of major successes and i've only got 10 minutes so the first one was oh, i'm trying to decide what to do you know what in some ways i just want to stop and see if there's questions before we end because i definitely don't want to take you the end of class when the end of class is 9 p.m. Yeah, th thumbs up if you want to hear Kate's last two examples of, of uh, success on different ends of the organizing spectrum and then do or a Q&A. Or leave it till next time. Or do we want to just do Q&A? Little secret, Kate just alluded to it. Uh, she's also going to help uh, put together the next session. Uh, and we are going to uh, uh, probably send out some feedback questions so that we can tailor the next session based on any feedback or questions you have off of this one. So Kate doesn't have to answer all of your questions right now because she's going to be back. Um, so if if you have questions, maybe put them in the chat. And then Kate, why don't you just like burn through your two examples and then I'll feed you questions from the chat. Yeah, sure. Okay. So... Um... In, in 2014, I was working at North Point Douglas Women's Center. Uh, uh, many communities in the city feel disconnected and disillusioned with politics. 
we wanted to create a venue for women that I was working with, but other organizations were working with to tell the mayoral candidates what they, what their priorities were. So we set up a day where people could learn about, uh, what happens at the city government, learn about, uh, what the city government, so what the city government does, and then, and then how to actually approach the mayors and say, this is what we need. So at Thunderbird House, we met for a full day and the morning was just educating women on what the city does. So policing, rec centers, libraries, sewer, water, roads. Um, and there were women there from North Point Davis Women's Center, West Central Women's Resource Center, North End Women's Center, uh, Gany Ganichik, and also Earcom. So there was, there was uh, like, dozens of women if not a hundred so the first part was just education the second part was asking the people who came what are your priorities like when you hear of all these services how is your life are they impacting your life in positive ways how do you need them to change to better better serve you and so they listed those in like small facilitated groups then there was a process of prioritizing which issues the whole group the 80 some women uh, wanted to see go forward. And then they selected amongst themselves who would be the, the, the people that asked the questions. So the mayoral candidates, uh, showed up in the afternoon. There was five or six that year. And they all introduced themselves. And then one by one representatives from the group, um, asked the question that the group had nominated them to ask, to ask. And the mayoral candidates had to ans- answer them one by one. And it was a remarkable day, and, and we got feedback that I didn't expect, uh, but I should have. Now, one of the pieces of feedback was that many of the women said, I've never been asked my opinion before. Other women said, I've never been treated seriously by a politician before. I've never engaged with someone like that in the past. The other thing that was interesting is that many women said that when we were talking about issues, their take on the issue was very different than how it was being discussed in the paper. This came up especially on transit. When we talk about safety on transit, often the conversation goes to safety on buses and the idea that maybe we should have security guards or something like that. The women that came to the event said the safety issue for them was that there wasn't, that their sidewalk wasn't plowed between their home and the, and the, and the bus stop. So it was very hard to get their stroller from the doorstep to the bus stop. Then they said, when we get to the bus stop, it often doesn't feel safe because it's poorly lit. So the the safety piece for me is waiting at the bus stop in an, in an unlet corner. And so that's, so so in other words, the, you know, the dominant conversation was like, safety when we talk about buses is on the bus. No, none of them talked about safety on the bus. For them, safety was what was happening on the street before and after they got off the bus. So we have to think about, like, how we educate one another and how we encourage one another to get involved in politics and how we provide the tools for everyone in our community to to, to be participating in political conversations so that what goes forward in policy discussion is what's actually needed on the ground. Next slide. Leah So the first question, the first picture is of Leah's launch party for her nomination. You know, and so she had to win a nomination against Andrew Swan, who had been in politics for his entire career, had been Minister of Justice. Um, and um, so Jenny, Jenny Hinkleman has the curly hair. She is a wizard. And, uh, she was a part of this team. And, uh, I, I kind of like, you know, gave, gave everyone a high five after the nomination and left. And then Joe and Maureen and a number of people were involved in carrying Leah through all the way to the end. And I want to read, please stay with me just until the end of, uh, what I talk about here. So I wrote a thank you note to all of our volunteers at the end of the the nomination. And I want to read it to you because 
it kind of show it shows how if you pay attention to your community all over time and you watch all of the different efforts happening to make change there are moments in time when all of those efforts can come together to make something like Leah Gazan beating Andrew Swan happen and then Leah Gazan beating Robert Falconulet happen and here is here is that story this is the letter of thank you that I wrote to our core volunteers. Um, I know I don't need to say this, but what we did last weekend when we won the nomination is historic. I think it's important to observe and document the ways this was made possible. Here are just a few. Number one, the constant resistance and resurgence of Indigenous organizing and activism. Leah has been leading this fight for her whole life. More recently, there's the surge that came with Chief Teresa Spence's resistance to Harper the rise of Idle No More and Leah's leadership here too. It's also important to name Tina Fontaine. One of the places she was last seen was adjacent to the West Central Women's Resource Center in the riding. The last time we saw numbers come together in the way they did for her vigil, uh, the way they did for the nomination was for Tina's vigil downtown. The way her death has contributed to increased awareness and desire for change is a part of the story. Number two, the historic legacy of progressive organizing in Winnipeg Center and Manitoba more generally. Myrna, Myrna um, is a uh, former MLA, very, very famous person, and her opening in the nomination was so representative of this. Some of the most active and effective longstanding organizers signed up early to Leah's campaign. Your presence paired with Leah's family legacy helped to anchor this campaign in a longstanding socialist history we're part of and lent depth and meaning to the work. This one was also built on more recent struggles as well. I saw evidence in the nomination room of critical mass rides of the early 2000s where friends of mine experienced violence by undercover police officers when riding their bikes. Some have still not recovered. They were in the room. The folks who staged a sit-in in Andrew Swan's office when he backed Harper's carceral bill. Those who have protested Errol Green's death and supported his family and others engaged in ongoing creative and intensive prisoner solidarity and abolitionist work. Folks involved in intensive decolonization, education, and ally work, particularly the Mennonite community, food security movement folks, community garden organizers and farmers, queer folks who organized the first health clinics to address AIDS in the 80s, and younger folks who are creating safe spaces, libraries, and supports for QT BIPOC folks, labor organizers coming up for air from fighting Pallister, Build 262 organizers, which is the, the federal bill to uh, align Canadian law with the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I also remember the Disability Community's incredible movement building work from last provincial election. The strength of that work was definitely felt in the room. Ongoing advocacy and organizing in the newcomer community, including recent establishment of the Manitoba Ethnocultural Council and work during the city election last summer to organize newcomer communities to vote and advocate for voting rights for those with permanent resident status. We received a lot of support this campaign from especially young people doing impressive work on climate justice, including today's rally at the ranch and the anti-poverty and nonprofit community, much of which would not exist without the work of key people involved in this campaign, like Choices, who organized in the 90s against Filmin and won a provincial government that created Neighborhoods Alive. So, you know, Leah managed to give a message that appealed to all of those people and all of those people felt like Leah had integrity in acting, you know, in concert with those movements. So that was like a very special moment in time and one with one when uh, all of those groups could come together. And that is what I wanted to say today. It's nine o'clock on the dot, you guys. Unmute. We all got to unmute here. We're going to do some applause. Thanks for listening. Uh, <laughs> we got a couple minutes for questions. Uh, um, so throw, throw them in the chat and, and I'll feed them to Kate. Uh, and then, like I said, uh, any feedback that we get from you on Slack between now and next month, Kate and I will use to, uh, to make next week even better. Uh, or next month even better. Um, so I'll just look back at my chat and see if there are any questions or just unmute yourself and uh and ask ask questions or comments okay
Okay. One question? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask a question. Th thumbs up if you learned something new tonight. That's, I think that's important. Okay. Uh, I'm going to put some people on the, on the spot. Nicole, just because you're on my screen right now, what did you learn tonight? Um, well, I really liked the last example of um, everybody coming together to help um, Leah, like, win the campaign. I thought that was really cool because you often see, I think you talked about it kind of earlier, you often talk about everybody kind of working for their separate goals. But then I think coming together at the end for, like, really amazing things to happen, I think that was that was really interesting to hear about. Awesome. awesome. Thanks. Dan? You're also, you just happen to be in my crosshairs on my Zoom screen. Yeah, I learned a few things. I think what was interesting to me is when you're talking about those two women that went to Brian Bowman and just had a conversation with him and it, it worked. Like that's pretty cool. Um, and just how they did it too. But also with the Andrew Swan thing, I was there that day they had that election where they announced it. And I didn't really know too much about Andrew Swan, so it's, I learned some stuff from you about him. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah, cool. thanks for listening. Any, any, anybody want to know more about something, or have like, like, uh, like, did we, did we uncover any, any like streams here that we should pursue further? Can I just have a quick hand count of how many folks are like? Like from Manitoba or like in like no Manitoba history because all of that is new to me. I don't really know a lot of it, but I didn't grow up here. So I was mm. just wondering like how many folks are in the same or maybe let's say how many folks grew up in Manitoba and are familiar with Manitoba history. Yeah, on that note, I'm especially interested in like, is Louis Riel a new person to people? I wasn't sure how much to say about him. As someone who's not from here, I, like, have been on a boat tour where you stop at the Louis Riel statue and <laughs> talk about it for 15 seconds. And maybe that's about all I knew, so it was really good for me. But it seems like maybe folks are more familiar. I wasn't sure if this is a good space to use for that. Maybe me and Maggie can do an American reading group sometime. <laughs> well, it's, just, on, just on that point, uh, there's for, for those of you who spend a lot of time in Winnipeg, you've probably seen the T-shirts or the branding that say Keeping It Riel which I think is amazing. And I don't know, Kate, if that's why you were focusing on the real today, but there are t-shirts that say keeping it real, which yeah. now has way more meaning for me. About yeah. I mean, I, I like the dad joke of that, but I'm actually, I actually have very high anxiety about the, the rise, the incredible rise in conspiracy theory right now. Um, I think it makes what was already dangerous in terms of the way that white supremacy erases so many challenges just just a lot worse. And so um, and I can see a lot of people falling into the trap of some of those ways of thinking. So so I, I wanted to I just wanted to and also, you know, because we're so far away from each other and we're working on Zoom and we're on social media, I. I really wanted to talk about like what is real and how do we know what is real? And one of the a slide that I think I didn't get to is um, is just really encouraging you to return to research and evidence. And um, you know, academia has there's lots of really reasonable critiques of academia, but it does offer rigor in terms of uh, some truth telling, you know, and, and, and understanding what's really happening around us. So uh, please, you know, I'm totally addicted to social media, but please, if, if that is also your story, balance that interest with like, like reading books <laughs> and, uh, and going to your academic sources. Yeah. I have another question actually. In regards to conspiracy theories, um, I'm asking this because I have a friend who is 
recently getting really into them. So I'm wondering what's an appropriate way to approach someone who is like kind of caught up in that world and educate them and kind of tell a different story. Like, cause sometimes I, like I'm not good at confronting people about that. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know you at all, but even just the way that you're asking that question, I think, I think you have such a, a soft and gentle approach in your style. And I think that that is perfect. And, you know, I think part, part of what happens with conspiracy theories, and it's going to be different for every person is that we are, we are collectively right now afraid and we collectively feel like we don't have control. And the thing that conspiracy theories do is they, they offer the illusion of knowing and the the illusion of control and i think it is it is very difficult if someone is in that state of mind or entertaining that state of mind to draw them out of it from a place of you're wrong i know better look at what you're doing to yourself can't, i can't believe what you're doing like all of those are the wrong approaches i think I think the more that we can do to stay in relationship with the, our friends and family members who are maybe entertaining those ideas and gently over time ask questions like, how are you doing? Tell me about your life, you know, offer care work. And then, you know, where appropriate, maybe like ask a little bit more questions about that, the better. I think it's important these days to try and stay in connection with one another rather than creating situations where we're, we're forcing each other apart. Yeah. And I'll just, I'll just hot proceed on that. Um, I think one thing that can be useful and I think Kate's talk tonight here has actually clarified this for me is like, like lean into that conversation and say like, what is real for you right now? Like ask your friend, like, what is your reality right now? Why are you, why are you feeling this way? And like, let's like kind of look at that and, and talk about it in a supportive, non-judgmental way. Cause I think a lot of the way we've been conditioned by media, uh, has sort of prevented or limited our ability to like examine our own beliefs on an ongoing basis. And I'd like to think that like I, like, like my values and politics and sort of understanding of the world continues to check out it it continues to sort of like like meet the test of my own examination and so i just think that like encouraging other people to examine those their own assumptions about life in their in in their own time in a supportive way is is one of the ways that we get there and hashtag keep it real dad joke sir Cool. Um, it's nine ten. Kate, thank you. Yeah, so such a pleasure to be here. We I, that was awesome. Um, for people uh, in the program, the last slide here. If you're interested in going to the gathering for free, shoot me an email. Uh, and if you want to help our PhD friend with her research on youth. Uh, experiences uh, around climate change and uh, well-being, please also contact us and uh, we'll communicate on Slack. And then, and then for real, for real, uh, you know, I don't know you folks at all beyond this Zoom screen, but I know that life is really, really gnarly right now. And for you to come onto this program and to uh, engage once a month into the late evening hours with everything else that's going on your plate. Like it means, I think it, it means a lot to the world. And, uh, our hope is that this is contributing and adding value to your growth and development as leaders, as informal and, and as sort of, uh, dynamic as, as it seems. Um, so I thought a, a fitting checkout question before we say goodbye is just, I want everybody to think of one word uh or a, a a set of two words um um uh or three words that capture 
how you're feeling right now. Uh, I'm going to start up uh, on my left. That's you, Kate. Um, oh, I have to say more than one, so I'm going to skip. Sorry, Joe, you were muted. Were you, were you saying me? I was muted. Thank oh. you. Uh, Maureen, you were next. Two words. Um, happy and ready to work with you more. <laughs> Great. Maggie. You're muted. I said a little stressed <laughs> because I have homework. Thanks. Zoe? Um, well, now I'm hopeful. I don't know. That like should definitely made me feel better. Great. Nicole? Um, I'd say optimistic, probably. Optimistic. Great. Robin? Um, tired, but inspired <laughs> tired but inspired and it's yeah. a rhyme there's mad bonus points for that thank you uh dan i'll go with tired and inspired too great uh zachariah uh intrigued and inspired cool chelsea i'm feeling very connected and inspired great caitlin I think I'm feeling very full, but hungry. Ah, uh, Sarah. Um, happy, excited, and motivated. Oh wait, that's two or three. You got it. That's good. That's good. Uh, and I'll say motivated. Um. I'm motivated to continue to enhance the way we do this program as we move forward um, because it, it feels to me like it's worth it. That was 15 words. I'm an asshole. Sorry. Eight. Go ahead, Kate. Well, really, you know, I just want to honor all the people each of you love, you know, like just one more way to keep it real. I was thinking, you know, as I was coming into this, how worried many of us are about our families. Maybe some of us have already lost people in this pandemic. And, um, you know, those relationships that you have with the people that you love are really, really important. And uh, uh, we're all figuring it out. So keep going, okay? Uh, thank you, everybody, for session two. It's 9.15. Have a wonderful week, month. Get in touch with us if you have questions about your placement. If you've got health or safety concerns around COVID, we want to know about that. Um, and any feedback or suggestions, uh, let's talk on, on Slack. Um, thank you. Good luck with your exams and uh, be well and be safe. I'm going to stay on for a few more minutes here. So uh, feel free to leave now. If you want to hang out and chat, chat uh, you can, but I'll be the last one to go. So. Bye-bye.